fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds. In the summer of 1940, Winston Churchill faced a terrible dilemma. We shall never surrender. France had surrendered, and only the English Channel stood between the Nazis and Britain. Germany was now poised to seize the entire French fleet, one of the biggest in the world. If the French fleet was transferred to German hands, the British would have been completely outmatched. Churchill had to make a choice. He could either trust the French promise that they would never hand over their ships to Hitler, or he could try to take control of the French Navy himself. Churchill's playing for the highest possible stakes. If it goes wrong, Churchill's finished, Britain's finished, war's over. Some call his decision a turning point, others a war crime. This is the forgotten story of Churchill's darkest decision. To sink the French fleet. We shall defend our island. Whatever the cost may be. To me, it was dreadful what we had to do. I don't have any pride in being part of it. Only great sadness. In July 1940, Robert Philpott was a gunner on British battleship HMS Hood when it was ordered to open fire on French sailors, men who had been allies just weeks earlier. We couldn't believe that we were going to do it. A rare newsreel from the time includes footage of the attack known as the French Pearl Harbor. Les salves se succèdent. L'amiral anglais menace de détruire une escadre Il y a encore quelques semaines à protéger les Anglais près de Dunkerque. Leon Leroux was just 19 years old and still cannot forget the horror of the attack. Tout était en feu, en flammes. Everything was burning. Même des brûlots. There were flames everywhere. Balls of fire landing in the sea. Men were screaming, "Save me!" And you could see bodies floating. It was hell, just hell. André Jaffre had recently celebrated his 18th birthday. I was surrounded by corpses and severed heads. Imagine, only two weeks before, we'd been with the British in Gibraltar out on the town, and then two weeks later they're firing on us. It was unthinkable. No, it's impossible. In just 10 minutes, almost 1,300 Frenchmen were killed outright, and hundreds more were injured and left for dead. One day we are allies, the next we are enemies. Why? It's not for me to answer that question. For that see Sir Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was in control, not our admiral. If it had been our admiral, we'd never have done it. But he had a direct order from Winston Churchill to do it now. Why did Churchill order the attack? The answer lies in eight weeks of political intrigue and military disaster, in which Churchill had to show that Britain would do anything to survive. On May the 10th, 1940, Hitler's army simultaneously invaded Belgium, Holland and France. On the same day, Winston Churchill became Britain's new Prime Minister. Churchill was confident that the combined might of Britain and France could hold the line against Germany. The two nations had mobilized over four million troops and had signed a treaty stating that neither country would surrender unless the other agreed. Well, May the 10th doesn't look too bad. If the French can hold the Germans on the German-French border, the British will fight a naval and air war, blockading and bombarding the Germans, and eventually the Germans will be defeated. It could be worse. 
But the Allies were totally unprepared for Hitler's new kind of warfare. In just five days, Nazi tanks had broken through French lines. Blitzkrieg seemed to be unstoppable. With Hitler's troops threatening to capture ports just 20 miles from Britain, Churchill now faced the prospect of a German invasion. The key to Britain's survival was naval power. Britain had the largest navy in the world, but it was scattered around the globe, protecting a vast empire. In May 1940, the ships were not where they were needed. We simply didn't have sufficient naval power to guarantee that we could stop a German armada crossing the Channel and the North Sea. Desperately short of ships, Churchill knew there was only one person he could turn to for help. America's President Roosevelt. For Churchill, who you have to remember is half American, uh, the thing that matters in 1940 is the Americans. From the start, in September 39, he's writing to President Roosevelt using this neat trick that they'd both been in naval administration earlier in their careers. And he's sounding Roosevelt out about coming to the assistance of Britain. He's trying to make Roosevelt understand that this is democracy's last throw, that if the British go down, America is next. Within hours of hearing the bad news from France, Churchill sent a telegram to Roosevelt. It was an urgent request for American warships. The scene has darkened swiftly. You may have a completely subjugated, Nazified Europe established with astonishing swiftness, and the weight may be more than we can bear. Immediate needs are the loan of 50 of your older destroyers. Roosevelt was privately sympathetic to Churchill's request, but there was a presidential election due in November and Roosevelt was campaigning on a pledge that he would not involve America in another European war. The United States of America shall and must remain unentangled and free. Two days after sending his request for aid, Churchill received Roosevelt's reply there would be no American warships. By now, Hitler's panzer divisions had advanced deep into French territory. The British forces in Europe had been cut off and were retreating towards the coast, while the French army was in disarray. On May the 20th, 1940, just 10 days after Churchill became prime minister, German troops reached the English Channel. Churchill appealed again to President Roosevelt for aid. This time he made a veiled threat. He warned that if Britain lost the war, Hitler might demand the Royal Navy as part of the peace deal. You must not be blind to the fact that the sole remaining bargaining counter with Germany would be the fleet. Excuse me, Mr. President, putting this nightmare bluntly. He very much is trying to blackmail the Americans. He's trying to impress upon them. We want to fight. Give us the tools to fight, because if you don't, the consequences are too horrendous to contemplate. If the Germans get their hands on the best navy in the world, then the United States has a problem. Churchill's attempt to scare America into action completely backfired. After reading this telegram, Roosevelt began to suspect that Churchill could not be trusted to stand up to the Nazis and would soon surrender. Instead of sending aid, Roosevelt began secretly plotting how he would defend America once Britain had fallen. A Canadian diplomat was summoned to the White House for a top secret meeting. Here, Roosevelt suggested that America and Canada should give up on Britain and look to their own defense. As Canada was part of the British Empire, Roosevelt wanted its Prime Minister, Mackenzie King, to ensure the Royal Navy was sent there before Churchill gave in. King was shocked by Roosevelt's plans, as his diary reveals. 
it seemed to me that the United States was seeking to save itself at the expense of Britain, that it was an appeal to the selfishness of the dominions at the expense of the British Isles. Those are pretty strong words. Mackenzie King is horrified. King cabled Churchill, explaining Roosevelt's bleak view of British prospects. It was now clear to Churchill that Roosevelt had little faith in Britain, or in him. Unless Churchill could prove he was capable of putting up a fight, there would never be any American assistance. Within weeks of Winston Churchill becoming Prime Minister, the military situation in France turned from disaster to catastrophic defeat. The British army were forced into a humiliating retreat from Dunkirk. While thousands of men were evacuated, the vital weapons and equipment were left behind and captured by the enemy. Mussolini entered the war on Hitler's side. The Germans advanced towards Paris, and the French army collapsed. The government fled the capital, along with millions of refugees. As Nazi troops entered Paris, French Prime Minister Paul Reynaud warned Churchill that he was on the verge of capitulation. Churchill was faced with the fact that if France surrenders, and it looks like it would be an abject, unconditional surrender given the situation, what will happen to the French fleet, which is substantial? Aircraft carriers, battleships. If the Germans can get their hands on that undamaged fleet, their ability to threaten British interests goes up exponentially. The French fleet is the most powerful fleet in European waters after the Royal Navy, and it really does hold the balance of power. If the French fleet goes over to the enemy with Italy and Germany, the British are outnumbered at sea, and they will lose the war. The alliance, signed by Britain and France, stated that neither country could surrender unless the other agreed. Churchill now told the French Prime Minister he would only allow him to seek terms with Hitler on one condition provided, but only provided, that the French fleet is sailed forthwith for British harbors. That night, the French Prime Minister resigned, and a new government was formed in the south of France. Ignoring Churchill's request, they broke the agreement with Britain and asked Hitler for a peace deal. Churchill now made a final appeal to the head of the French Navy, Admiral Francois Dallin. Dalla had commanded the French fleet for many years and was highly respected in Britain. Churchill knew him quite well. Dalla inspired absolute loyalty in his men and had told Churchill at a previous meeting that he would never surrender his ships to Hitler. Churchill sent a British envoy to beg Dalla to ignore the French government and order his fleet to Britain before the armistice was formally signed. Dalan repeated his solemn assurance that he would never let his fleet fall into German hands. Churchill hoped this meant that the ships would soon be on their way. But as the days passed, the French Navy didn't move. This is William L. Shirer speaking from the forest of Compiègne, where Adolf Hitler today is handing his armistice terms to France. It is 3.15 p.m. Hitler offered the French government a deal. If they accepted his conditions, they could continue to administer unoccupied southern France. One of Hitler's requirements was that the French fleet must return to home ports within weeks, where it would remain under German supervision. The French government agreed. It took several hours for the details to reach London. Churchill was horrified to read the agreement his allies had signed. Churchill was absolutely astonished. He was very frightened. At first, he didn't believe it. He couldn't believe that the French would agree to such a thing. He felt betrayed in many ways by Admiral Dalla. 
But Admiral Darlan was still trying to keep the promise he had made to Churchill. On hearing the armistice conditions, Darlan sent a message to every ship in the French Navy. If at any time the Germans tried to take over, the crew must scuttle their ships immediately. By issuing this order, Darlan believed he had honored his pledge. All Churchill had to do was trust him. The War Cabinet had a long discussion about what should be done, and the top secret annex of the War Cabinet minutes has Churchill's response. The Prime Minister said that in a matter so vital to the safety of the whole British Empire, we could not afford to rely on the word of Admiral Dala. Many ministers were in favour of negotiating directly with individual French ships, in the hope that their commanders might be persuaded to ignore the armistice and join Britain's war effort. But Churchill was already thinking of more drastic measures. Churchill wound up the meeting with the following words. The Prime Minister agreed, but stressed that in no circumstances must we run the mortal risk of allowing these ships to fall into the hands of the enemy. Rather than that, we should have to fight and sink them. Under the armistice agreement, all French ships would be under German control within days. Churchill now took the decision that would change the course of history. He ordered the Admiralty to draw up a plan to secure the French fleet by persuasion or by force. It was called Operation Catapult. Operation Catapult is high stakes. If it goes wrong, if it goes badly wrong, Churchill's finished, Britain's finished, war's over. This is Churchill saying, we need to do this to stay in this game. Operation Catapult would involve several simultaneous actions around the world. There were 14 French warships, several submarines, and almost 200 smaller vessels in British ports preparing to return to France. These would be seized in a dawn raid. At Alexandria in Egypt, there was a French battleship and four cruisers, but they were trapped inside a British base. The most important targets were in French Algeria. The town of Iran had a fortified harbour called Mers El Kabir. Moored here was the main French battle fleet, including the two ships that Churchill feared the most. The Dunkirk and the Strasbourg were modern battle cruisers that could outclass most British ships. At Mers El Kabir, they were supported by two older battleships, six destroyers and submarines, forming a deadly strike force. Hoping to avoid a violent confrontation with this powerful squadron, Churchill personally drafted an ultimatum for the French admiral in Mers El Kabir. It offered three choices. A. Sail with us and continue the fight. B. Sail to a British port. C. Sail to a French port in the West Indies or to the United States. If you refuse these fair offers, I must, with profound regret, require you to sink your ships within six hours. The British assembled a fleet in Gibraltar to deliver the ultimatum to Mers El Kabir. It was called Force H and included the world's largest battleship, HMS Hood. In command was Admiral James Somerville. On receiving his orders, Somerville voiced his doubts about the mission, arguing the French would not respond well to threats. As Force H travelled through the night towards the Algerian coast, Somerville received Churchill's uncompromising reply. If the French will not accept any of your alternatives, they are to be destroyed. On July the 3rd, 1940, Winston Churchill launched a global operation to seize the French Navy. It began with troops boarding all French vessels in British ports.
In Plymouth, one of the targets was the Surcouf, the biggest submarine in the world. Hearing the noise upstairs, the French captain woke his men and went to investigate. As the British searched the Surcouf, the ship's engineer began destroying records and code books, while the French captain refused to surrender his vessel. Je ne bouge pas. Moments later, there was a sudden eruption of violence. The final death toll was four. The French engineer and three British servicemen. For the first time since the Battle of Waterloo, Britain and France had exchanged fire. Though the remaining crew surrendered, it was an ominous warning that peaceful seizure of the French fleet could not be guaranteed. And the real confrontation had yet to begin. As the sun rose over the Mediterranean, Force H arrived at Iran, ready to present Churchill's ultimatum. Robert Philpott was a 20-year-old trainee gunnery officer on the British flagship HMS Hood. Really, it was all very peaceful. Nobody was doing any firing. There was a fairly happy mood on board. We all firmly believed that the ships would come out and join us. We know the French sailors were just anxious to get on with the war. So we didn't think it would be a great problem. Many ordinary French sailors, ignorant of the political situation, were excited by the arrival of the British. André Jaffre was an 18-year-old gunner on the French battleship Britannia. Our officer scrutinizes the horizon, then looks through his binoculars and smiles. What is it, Captain? The British have arrived. Really? Yes, we were happy. We thought they'd come to get us to continue fighting against the Nazis. Leon Leroux was a 19-year-old messenger on board the French Admiral's flagship, the Dunkirk. Rumors travel fast, so we found out quickly that there was a British fleet outside the port of Oran. And we heard that a small torpedo boat, the Foxhound, had entered the harbor. And so we thought it was a bit odd. The Foxhound had been sent ahead to open negotiations while the rest of the British fleet waited several miles offshore. On board was Captain Hookie Holland, a fluent French speaker who had been the naval attaché in Paris. The Foxhound signalled the French commander, telling him that Captain Holland wanted a meeting. French Admiral Marcel Jean-Soul immediately felt offended that the British were sending a low-ranking captain to confer with him. Jean-Soul ordered the Foxhound to leave the harbour immediately. But Captain Holland was determined to deliver his ultimatum and set off towards the French flagship in a motor launch. One of the big problems at Mezel Kabir is the French Admiral Jean Soule is really not a man to take decisions. Jean Soule doesn't have any judgment. He refuses to even meet Captain Holland, who was well known to him. Just obstructive, negative. Uh, Jean Soule either doesn't want to believe or refuses to understand that the British are serious. Holland was intercepted in the middle of the bay. Unable to meet the French admiral in person, he handed over the ultimatum to Jean Soule's lieutenant. The French were given six hours to either join Britain, leave European waters, or face a British attack. The deadline was set for 3.30 p.m. When Jean Soule finally read the terms, he was incensed by the British threats. He ordered his ships to raise steam and prepare for action, then sent a handwritten reply to Captain Holland, stating that the French fleet would meet force with force. 
J'ai un camarade qui... My friend, who works on the bridge, he says, the English have sent us an ultimatum. We are not moving, we are staying here. Now, as simple sailors, didn't really know what was in the ultimatum. Then there was a message. Return aboard immediately. We are being recalled to the ship. And then we received the order. Everyone to combat posts. On board HMS Hood, Admiral Somerville was watching the sudden activity aboard the French ships when he received Jean Soule's reply. Under orders to prevent them escaping at all costs, Somerville ordered planes from the aircraft carrier Ark Royal to drop mines at the entrance to the port. At one o'clock I was on deck stretching my legs and I could see some British planes flying overhead. They were laying mines at the mouth of the harbour. We thought, this is beginning to smell like trouble. We wondered why they were blocking us in. We were trapped. By now, Jean Soule had relayed the situation back to his superiors in mainland France. Admiral Darlan was insulted that Churchill clearly did not trust him to keep his pledge. Angry at the British threats, Darlan authorized an order calling for reinforcements. All French forces in the Mediterranean were ordered to Mers el Kabir to support Jean Soule. With the deadline of 3.30 fast approaching, Jean Soule heard reinforcements were on their way. Playing for time, he now invited Captain Holland onto his flagship. The British deadline was suspended to allow negotiations to proceed. I think the French Admiral was doing a certain amount of bluffing. I don't think he really thought that uh, we would, when it came to it, open fire. When Holland boarded the French flagship, Jean Soule showed him the secret message sent by Admiral Darlan ten days earlier. It ordered all French sailors to sabotage their ships if the Germans tried to take control. Both men believed that this should have been enough to allay the British fears. But events were now moving beyond their control. In London, the British Admiralty intercepted Darlan's call for backup and warned Churchill that French reinforcements could arrive at any time. Churchill now decided that the time had come for action and issued a final message to Admiral Somerville. His orders were short and brutal. Settle matters, quickly. On receiving Churchill's message, Somerville signaled the French flagship. If no agreement was reached within 30 minutes, he would open fire. This, of course, was pretty devastating news to the lower deck, on which I was at the time. We couldn't imagine open, opening fire on our friends and allies. The deadline was reached and negotiations had failed. This photograph captures the moment when Captain Holland said goodbye to Admiral Jean Soul. He later said, our leave-taking was friendly. But Holland knew he had just minutes to reach safety. Admiral Somerville's squadron unleashed one of the most concentrated big gun broadsides in history. A French camera crew filmed the entire attack. An artillery salvo. We didn't have time to take a breath. Another salvo. And a third. I can't describe what it was like. There was fear, terror, a deafening noise that makes your ears bleed. You think about yourself, of course, but you also think about the others. Unable to maneuver inside the docks, the French warships were sitting ducks. You 
It was like shooting fish in a barrel. The British 15-inch shells were devastatingly effective. The third salvo scored a direct hit on André Jaffre's ship, the Britannia. A flaming ball, a shell, flew across my battery. It exploded below me, right amongst the fuel and the ammunition. I looked around me and saw a friend of mine who put his head too near the gun cover and had his head blown off. He was completely decapitated. The blood dripped off me. I wanted to be sick. I was still next to my gun and I began to singe. My feet were burning. My shoes were on fire and I was pleading with the Lord and the Virgin Mary. What's happening to me? I don't want to die, age 18. The shells kept on falling. I remember men shouting, kill me, kill me, because they were so badly burned or they had lost limbs. They were asking to be finished off. It's just panic, total panic. So many shells, you wonder how much damage is this causing. And how many more will they kill? I saw the water. It was black, with smoking oil and small flames. Not like petrol, but like a chip pan, bubbling away. In there, there were men who were struggling and screaming. It was horrific. C'était abominable. They continued the shelling, so I decided to jump in. I wanted to go as deep as possible to be sheltered from the gunfire. But when I jumped in, I fell into boiling oil, so I let myself sink. I was so burned. It was so painful. So I tried to swim underwater as far as possible from the boat. But I needed to breathe. And every time I surfaced, I came up into boiling oil. So I had to breathe in smoke and oil. And I dive again. I did that for as long as I could. As André struggled in the burning oil, he turned to see the fate of his ship, the Britannia, and its crew of over a thousand men. Eventually, I found an area with no oil. I turned onto my back and from there, I saw an appalling sight. The Bretagne was capsizing completely. It happened quickly. In 20 seconds, she capsized. 20 seconds. On the Bretagne, there were almost 1,000 dead. Everyone was killed. Everyone. And that was the end of those poor men. That's what I saw. Terrible and apocalyptic things that I wish with all my heart I will never see again. After just 10 minutes, Admiral Somerville decided he had done enough and gave the order to cease fire. It was shattering to see what we had just done. There was smoke, fires burning everywhere. It was a scene of utter devastation. I think the whole crew were uh, very upset. It was not something we were very proud about. 
Despite the carnage, Admiral Somerville had failed to complete his mission. He had sunk the Britannia and disabled the battlecruiser Dunkirk along with some less important ships. But the second French battlecruiser, the Strasbourg, had slipped through the minefield with five destroyers and escaped to Toulon in mainland France. Worse still, the British hoped that they could peacefully persuade the French to hand over their fleet had ended in a massacre. 1,297 French sailors were dead and 350 wounded. It was a higher death toll than in any single naval action taken against the Germans since the war began. Elsewhere, Operation Catapult was more successful. At the base in Alexandria, the French squadron had been forced to demobilize without any bloodshed. In Britain, almost 200 vessels, including the submarine Surcouf, had been seized and were now under British control. But Churchill knew he would now have to explain to Parliament, the public and the American president. In France, the news of the massacre at Mers el Kabir caused outrage. There really is a risk that the French will declare war. Had Admiral Dalan had his way, the French would have gone to war straight away. He's apoplectic. French bombers made a retaliatory raid against the British naval base in Gibraltar. But they inflicted little damage and there were no casualties. The French government was still reeling from the German occupation of northern France. With millions of starving refugees to deal with, they were in no position to take further military action. Instead, they severed diplomatic relations with Britain for the duration of the war. We thought, who are these English savages? It was hate, just hate. Allies the day before and enemies the day after. They come and sink us. What do you expect the French to think? It was a betrayal. But not only a betrayal, it was murder. When your hands are tied behind your back and the barrel of a gun is pointing at you, would you call that a crime? Yes, it's a real crime. It's murder. For Hitler, it was a golden opportunity for anti-British propaganda. Posters appeared of a drowning French sailor and depicting Churchill as an octopus grasping at the French Empire. Churchill himself was horrified by the scale of the French casualties. When Churchill got the news of, of Mers el Kabir, he was physically sick. He was devastated. He obviously had great difficulty in knowing how to explain it because he thought that there would be outrage in the Commons that we had fired upon an ally. On July the 4th, 1940, his 54th day in office, Churchill made a speech to the House of Commons justifying his decision. It was later broadcast to the nation. The transference of these ships to Hitler would have endangered the security both of Great Britain and the United States. We therefore had no choice but to act as he did. John Colville, Churchill's private secretary, wrote in his diary. He told the whole story of Iran, and the House listened enthralled and amazed. Gasps of surprise were audible. I heard him say, this is heartbreaking for me. When it was over, he, he started crying. He, he, he began to cry. He was quite overwhelmed. The reaction from Parliament was completely unexpected. He was astonished that the House went berserk with, with cheers and enthusiasm and, of course, with relief, a tremendous sense of relief that these damn warships were not going to be the, the stepping stone, one way or another, of a German invasion of Britain. The problem of the French fleet has been solved in the only way we could allow it to be solved, and the White Ensign carries on.
The British press and the public thoroughly approved of the attack. From the Royal Navy and from the nation, there is wholehearted support for the government's action. But the reaction that mattered most of all to Churchill came from America. Roosevelt, when he heard of what Britain had done, finally laid to rest his lingering doubts that Britain didn't have the strength or the guts to carry on. As a result of Marcel Kabir, Roosevelt said, I can send them the supplies they desperately need, the guns, the ammunition, the aircraft, the tanks, because they're not going to give in. This is the record of one of the most momentous transactions in our history, the taking over of some of the 50 destroyers from the United States. Just two months after the attack, Roosevelt gave Churchill the warships he so desperately needed. It is the cooperation of the two great English-speaking peoples in the fight against Nazi aggression. It was Mers El Kabir that paved the way for an ever-increasing flow of American aid to Britain that continued throughout the war. For Churchill, the decision to attack his former allies was justified. But from the French perspective, there is strong evidence that the entire action was completely unnecessary. In November 1942, the Nazis occupied the south of France and tried to seize the remaining ships of the French Navy from their base in Toulon. After surviving Meurs El Kabir, André Jaffre was in Toulon when news arrived that the Germans were advancing on the port. In the middle of the night, everyone was woken up. In the distance, we could hear the Germans, the clicking of the tanks. The French sailors now carried out the secret order issued by Admiral Dahlin more than two years earlier. Using fire, explosives and brute force, they sabotaged their ships. I was there when we scuttled the fleet. I sabotaged my equipment and my 90mm gun. I gave it a hammering. I broke the fuses and smashed the magazines. And then the Germans came. The French disabled almost 70 ships before the German troops could stop them. They arrived all pleased, thinking, we're going to have a nice fleet, but nothing. We scuttled everything. They were furious. They had marched for miles to get these boats. We were laughing. I remember laughing with a friend. But a swift hit with a gun butt in your kidneys, a kick, and they were hitting us on the ground. <laughs> Bastards. For many in the French Navy, this was the final proof that there was never any danger of their ships ending up in German hands, and that the British action at Meurs El Kabir was an unnecessary betrayal. Within days, Winston Churchill received this letter from Admiral Dahlin. In it, he wrote, Prime Minister, you said to me, I hope you will never surrender the fleet. I replied, there is no question of doing so. It seems to me that you did not believe my word. The destruction of the fleet at Toulon has just proved that I was right. This is why, almost 70 years later, the French survivors of Meurs El Kabir remain bitter. Winston Churchill should have believed the orders given to the French fleet and signed by Admiral Darlan. I do not forgive Churchill. I do not forgive the British government. I will never forgive. Despite what he suffered, André Jaffre bears no grudge towards the British. It's not betrayal. It was war and everything that comes with it. Have you ever seen an intelligent war? Let's say I was sad, deeply sad, to know that our English friends had sunk us. But what can you do? I speak as an equal, 
as a French sailor to a British sailor. It's our bosses who decide. And it's always the same ones who suffer. In his speech in the House of Commons, Churchill said that history would, would be the judge. What has history decided? For the French, it was almost a war crime that Britain then killed more than 1,200 French sailors. For the British, it was the only way that Britain could survive. We had no choice. If the Americans had been in the war at that stage, we could have perhaps coped. But the Royal Navy wasn't big enough to cope with the German fleet and the French fleet. So distressing it was, but it had to be done. And that in wartime, one has to do distasteful things. Now, tomorrow at nine, we have a Time Team special, digging in Flanders for a lost bunker from the First World War. Coming up next on 4, extraordinary television, open heart surgery live. <laughs>